uh, it was a great effort. Everybody, anybody remember sitting in this room, working with the architect back there, working out plans? <clears throat> it was a great concept, great set of plans. However, when Pastor Ed did the feasibility study back then, um, finding was, it was great, congregation loved it, however, the price tag was just too much. It would have been inappropriate for this church to take that on. <clears throat> Excuse me. So that was kind of tabled and set aside. Fast forward to 2019, when the trustee said, hey, let's try again. Let's look at a smaller scale, scale back effort. Um, so at our 2019 church conference, one of the items on the agenda was to uh, vote for a resolution to look at this on a smaller scale back uh, project. <coughs> Anybody remember that? 2019? Here's the, uh, the resolution. Can everybody read that? <laughs> let me let me read it for you. At least the next to last paragraph. <clears throat> Be it resolved that the trustees are hereby authorized to proceed with the process of inquiry to include a team of leaders appointed by the trustees and Pastor Keith Roucher, <clears throat> and to utilize the services of Dimensions Four, Pastor Ed in order to explore the potential for any necessary and required renovations and new construction with findings to be reported to the trustees, the church council, and the congregation in keeping with the disciple of the United Methodist Church. And be it further resolved that the process will authorize the trustees to continue conversations with an architect for limited concept drawings and will include a consultation process with the congregation no later than March 15th, 2020. We're a little bit late on that. Um, and there's a reason for that, which I'm gonna get to. So that was back in 2019. It's now 2023. Um, the exploratory team was convened uh, had some really, really good members from our church serve on that. So if you see your name down here at the lower half, would you please stand up just for some acknowledgement? <clears throat> really good group. We've met several times over the years. Um, this was kicked off in 2019. 2020, March of 2020, I was all set to brief our congregation along with Pastor Keith. And if you can remember what happened in March of 2020, COVID, and we pretty much shut down. In fact, just a few days before that, that briefing, Pastor Keith and I talked and said, we, you know, there's so many unknowns, we can't, we just can't do it. So. Uh, we basically lost 18 months because of COVID. Then the team got together again in uh, the fall of 2021. And if, you're, if you were on that uh, crew, on that team, we, we met a few times and then we looked around the room and said, there's a really big project coming up with our church <laughs> called the initials JCS. Jesus Christ Superstar, and everybody in this room is very heavily involved with that. Nor do we want to have our church be spread too thin and be working on this effort while the preparations for Jesus Christ Superstar were going on. So we decided as a team, just take a pause for eight or nine months and then resume after we all caught our breath and, re and um, caught our breath from Jesus Christ Superstar, which, my gosh, what a tremendous effort, tremendous project, tremendous experience that was. And it showed me at the time what this church is capable of doing when we all work together, right? So after
after that, um, we actually started, we reconvened in earnest, in, in seriousness, back last June or July, last summer, and um, had several meetings back and forth. I've been working with our architect, and um, we're now ready to uh, show, share the uh, preliminary uh, concept plans with you. These were the priorities that we used when we when we met, and these this should look very familiar because I I briefed this at a couple uh, church conferences I, I believe or prior to church conferences, but our priorities were number one full size elevator, ADA compliant restrooms, hospitality welcome area area. We definitely wanted to improve the. Uh, safety and security of our toddler nursery rooms, which are right by that the ramp door. And we are really lacking with storage. If you if you are here any any amount or work here or do things, you know that storage is very, very limited. Other areas of consideration, some of these are big projects that the trustees have just, uh, <coughs> we know that they're out there, but we've We've decided that it didn't make sense to repave our parking lot, which is crumbling, falling apart, if we're going to have construction vehicles come in here in another year or so, okay? Um, about a year ago, I'm thinking, the church council did a survey asking the congregation, what do you think about our church? What do you think of our, our facilities? And these were the, the summary results. Interesting, almost everything on the feedback summary matched up with what the exploratory team was working with. Need more space, uh, nursery at the front door, accessibility, elevator. Um, Thanks, Siri. <laughs> so everything there, almost everything there matches up with our condensed list of priorities. Okay, so that gave us some a really good feel that hey, our team was matching up with feedback we got from our congregation. So, um, like I said, we have been working with the architects since then, and with that. I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Scott Graham, who is one of the principals from Muhlenberg Green Architects. He also is the president of the firm, so I'm gonna turn it over to Scott. Thank you very much for coming here this morning and being here, and uh, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, 
So thank you, Randy, for the introduction. My name is Scott Graham. I'm one of the current partners at uh, we're going by Mulebur or MGR Techs now. We are formerly Mulebur Green. We have been oh sorry. So I am one of the current three partners of Muhlenberg Green Architects, or MG Architects, as we're going by now. Uh, we have been in continuous operation since 1920. Uh, so we are a general design firm. We've, uh, we're based in Wyomissing, Pennsylvania, just outside of Reading. Uh, I took over this project, we'll call it uh, winter 2022. Uh, so I've had a chance to become familiar with the building and the work that's been done to date as far as the phase one master planning. Um, we continue to develop it in the last few months to present, uh, develop what you have in front of you. It is based off the findings uh, and design efforts uh, that were previously carried out since 2019, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, um, to jump right into it, uh, the, the study was based on the findings of a committee-based approach for the church to identify the needs that ran the, uh, the needs that Randy went over. Uh, so hopefully we are satisfying all of them and generating some great interest for the project. Uh, to briefly run over them, uh, first theme being an improved entry and welcoming sequence for the church. Uh, we have a grand front facade that probably gets utilized very little compared to the back. So what we'd like to do is add some curb appeal to the functional entrance to the building. Uh, make it accessible, obviously. There are some uh, gestures for accessibility, but it, it's not currently code compliant, and I'm sure it's presented challenges to the congregation in the past. Uh, we're gonna create a new covered portico probably redo the roof line. Um, some of this is gonna be altered, or uh, <clears throat> some of the updates are required just to accommodate the new proposed elevator off of the front lobby. Uh, and we wanna pay a lot of attention to just functionality and that entry sequence, making it a welcome, uh, welcoming experience for the congregation and its guests to come in. Um, accessibility, as Randy touched on, is a big one. <clears throat> design approach for accessibility in the 50s is a lot different than it is now. <laughs> uh, so our design concept, uh, number one, includes a new modern elevator that I think people will be comfortable getting into, uh, especially if it's more than one person. <laughs> um, and really focusing on uh, having all congregants be able to utilize as much of the facility as possible. There's no-go areas right now, just based off uh, built-in restrictions. So not every area in the building is going to be fully accessible, but we're going to try to make as much of it as possible, as well as not necessarily being dependent on an elevator to do it. Uh, so one of the new additions for anybody that may have been privy to the previous phase one design is a comprehensive landscape of the uh, southeast corner of the building over here to create an on-grade uh, route to traverse from the, uh, the uh, south end of the parking lot down to our new uh, hospitality and flex use areas. Uh, as well, just creating some modern accessible restrooms uh, that everybody can use meeting current accessibility. Touching on security and life safety, uh, big thing, more on-grade access, you know, that counts for egress from the building as well, not just utilization of the building by all. Uh, so having those on-grade egress points uh, will make sure everybody can get out of the building <coughs> in a safe manner without being dependent on help. Um, the revised childcare layout, which is a direct function of limiting access or access from the entry point uh, directly into the child care center so we're going to make that entry more circuitous which 
provides more opportunity for the worst to be prevented. Um, the big theme for the building would be an increase for flexible and hospitality space. So that's, uh, that's the primary driver for the entire project, right? Uh, so we, as part of the new entry, we're gonna be developing, we already have a broad hallway there that leads to nowhere. Uh, so really we're envisioning that as an extension of the new hospitality <coughs> space on the east side of the building that we're proposing to create on the main level. Uh, this would serve as the, uh, the avenue to get to childcare on the back side. <coughs> And also just a flexible hospitality area, lounge. Uh, there is a modest food service component, hospitality bar. So I leave it to your imaginations to figure out how that ultimately is gonna be used. Uh, but I'm sure it'll provide some interesting opportunities. Uh, alongside of that is an elevated deck. So to bring outdoor, er, outdoors in and indoors out, uh, plenty of glass along that wall to really uh, create a new connection, especially with all the landscaping we're going to do out front. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, along with that renovation comes the creation of a new flexible space, uh, the lower level, pretty much right over here, uh, which will, again, use your imagination, but a good multi-purpose space, um, you know, providing an additional venue, perhaps outside of this room, uh, maybe more of a softer, uh, softer look. So uh, who knows what's going to happen in there? Rehearsal space. Uh, if it's adjacent to the music room, uh, I hear you guys are kind of big on that. <laughs> uh, and again, finally, this landscape plan and the green space we're going to be creating. So along with this secure this uh, or serpentine pathway, which will be accessible. Um, we do have the opportunity to create some nice lawn areas. So, again, I use, leave it to your imagination to figure out what you're going to do with them. Uh, but at least it'll be some place to have programmatic uh, or program functions outside. Uh, and again, the multi-purpose room onto the lawn. That's uh, we'll try to make that as open as possible to create some nice vistas out of the space. Uh, and then finally, just I'd like to reiterate that we're trying to work towards providing as much flexibility and functional space to the congregation as possible. Uh, don't really have anything else, so I'll try to be brief. Um, but again, thank you for allowing us to help with this project. Really appreciate it. It seems very exciting. I'm, I'm hoping to continue moving forward with it. Scott, um, just for those that haven't maybe the first time seeing this, just to kind of, uh, everything that's shaded on this drawing would be either new or renovated. Okay, so we're not, we're not looking at doing the whole church. We're basically looking at, if you look outside these first two windows, that would be a new, it's called lobby on your plans for the lower level, but that lobby is basically a new room that, as Scott said, could be used for a multitude of things, small groups, um, seniors could go down there and do yoga mm -hmm. if the weather's bad, and they could just walk out the door to that open, flat, grassy area to do outdoor yoga when the weather's good, um, Seiko, could maybe use that room for some uh, for some means, or go outside and actually have a safer outdoor play area on level ground because there's a retaining wall that kind of naturally keeps the kids on the flat area instead of running out towards the road. Okay, um, or small groups during summer theater could meet outside or on the deck or upstairs in the hospitality area. So I'd take this home and think about all the, all the things that could be done with, with those areas. 
also want to say there will be in those on those plans there will be new additional ADA compliant restrooms okay both upstairs and downstairs okay next steps what you're looking at are preliminary designs they're not final or preliminary we want to hear back from you so take the plans home have a look at them um, and you'll have an opportunity to let us know let pastor ed know in the coming weeks or coming months what you think what you like um, and if you don't care for something let us know that too um, but i i think you're gonna see that it's uh, pretty exciting and a lot to like about those plans. The exploratory team will continue to work with Pastor Ed, working to, to uh, build a case of support document, and this will allow Pastor Ed to determine how we move forward as a church. So having said that, I'm gonna turn it over to Pastor Ed for, for his portion, portion. <coughs> you shorten your time down to two hours. Okay. All right. Lord be with you. And I'll come to you. you. So you're going to pass on material on, on my behalf and for the interest of the congregation. There are a lot of factors and variables. I'm happy for Scott to be with us. Thank you, Scott. A remarkable presentation, and I'm for it. Are you ready to vote or no? <laughs> one, of the, one of the significant variables is the timeline. And I have my own interests in the investment in this particular project. But the longer we delay Scott with the drawings, the more difficult the process becomes. So we've been doing a lot of tinkering with the drawings over the numbers of months that we've been together looking at this possible outcome. So what I've put together for you is a capital campaign timeline. And for those of you who are not familiar with my work over the years since 2014 and before uh, across the connection, uh, if you're interested, some people always say, well, how much money have you actually raised? And the answer is about 34 million. And most of that I kept to buy my yacht. <laughs> so 34 million is a really good number in all the ways in which I've been working with Dimensions 4 and in other places. You should also have a copy of a brochure. I gave that, uh, there are 35 copies of a working brochure that defines if you would be interested in it to keep it, that's okay with me. If you don't need it, lay it back on the table so I can continue to pass them out to others. By way of my own introduction, uh, some of you remember my wife, Joan, yes? Yes. Yeah, when Joan was dying, she wanted to know if I was going to do anything productive. <laughs> that's, that's the very short version of a long conversation over four years together until her death. And she was keenly interested in me doing something effective that would be larger than just local church pastorate, so I started dimensions for coaching and consulting services and she was a part of that visioning process and i'm so proud of it so before we get too far along into this i want you to know that there are a couple things in my own journey that are imperatives one uh, if you have a chance to look at the brochure don't you don't need to do it now it is a second or a third way to look at capital campaigns some of you may have done a lot of those some few of those and my interest in the first one, uh, which we could not proceed because of the limited available cash and commitments for that larger project, that doesn't mean we cannot do another one. So for all of us to think about the renewal, the renovations, the upgrades, Scott, that you have done, I'm very happy with that myself. So I only can encourage you to do what Randy recommended, is to take the material home, look at it, but don't delay in responding, because the timeline moves every time there is a delay, yes? Yeah. And then we get into what kind of supply chain issues, I'm thinking about that a lot. 
Yeah, he knows about uh, supply chain issues that could block much of what we have done. So the second thing to consider is, I've written this, it's not a proposal, it's just an outline of how a capital campaign could work based upon a timeline like this, and it's gonna be redundant in the presentation. I anticipate if I follow the handout that is the vertical one, those steps toward a campaign, feasibility study and recommendations, based upon a timeline that begins shortly with the Explore team and our authorizations for a writing team, which has to happen pretty soon, I could have it all done before Thanksgiving. Whether or not that meets any, anybody else's expectations, I know that we can do a feasibility study and complete it the week before Thanksgiving. What do you think? That means it's possible, based upon recommendations that come out of the feasibility study, that whatever the building portion of the team wants to do uh, could begin sometime in 24, I, I'm hoping early in 24 if that were the case, uh, but Scott would be able to help us understand with contracting and all of those things and the supply chain whether 24 is actually a possibility. Another factor is the generosity of the congregation given the congregation's growth, its goals and objectives, and the size, literally, of the donor pool. So we started looking at the possibilities for a capital campaign. I'm, I'm sure Scott has talked to everybody on the Explore team about that. I wasn't here when you did. But the projected cost of it all is gonna be redundant in the presentation is approximately $2 million. Is that close? Thank you very much. <laughs> is your firm donating a million in kind? How's <laughs> that working out? <clears throat> so the key for me is timeline, availability of a donor pool, how big is the donor pool, uh, and the flexibility of the chart of gifts. There's no chart of gifts in this, but I know what it is. I've tried three different iterations of a chart of gifts, and this will come clear to you when we move forward. Let's go to the next slide. The first slide in this process, I have my own, uh, my own slides here, so you look at that, I'll talk from my, my notes. This is a transitional slide from everything that you've heard about the history, the projects, the stopping and starting, and what I think is on, on the minds of the Explore team would be one of those things to structure a capital campaign with authorizations and you'll see in the material we're going to have to have, according to our current discipline anyway, three church conferences to move the entire project forward. The opportunity to give everybody an opportunity to participate is a remarkable thing. There is no secret about any of this, and I think the more that we get congregational participation, the better likelihood of success in raising the funds. If you look at project leadership team, uh, we still don't have a formal structure in place, and you do not have a contract with me, so that's an interesting concept. So I'm doing this because I think it's gonna work out that we work together again. But there has to be a letter of understanding, I call them when I'm functioning out of my company, a letter of understanding that I will propose this, the way in which I will work with the congregation the leadership team, the leadership team will have to do a lot of authorizations along the way, and there will have to be a building committee and a campaign committee as subsets, uh, along with many work teams that will involve a lot of people to make this all work for us, best case scenario. So one of the first, first things I'm going to ask, I'll present a letter of understanding to your leadership team, and then we will move, I will move with you as effectively as I can if that letter of understanding is approved or amended. If you think about the project team itself in a normal building program as we have had here before, the project team should not be the leadership team. Too much to think about. So we would have to design out of the leadership team's recommendations and others. A project team that will oversee the entirety of the renovation and building project. Subsets of that would be the capital campaign team and the building committee team, and that's recommended in here, with lots of functions that I have the capacity to spell out for you in some detail. 
One of the most significant things is at the bottom of this first indentation, the reporting functions have to be in the hands of people who really do constant communication. What do you think? Mm -hmm. We can't withhold information, we have to be sharing and share well. So at the bottom I put to the building committee and the campaign team, so these are the three most significant structures to get started. Project team, building team, campaign team, with lots of work product in it. So you can see why the leadership team cannot be the project team. That's going to be a whole separate set of laity and the pastors and staff that are assigned or volunteer to any particular thing, members of the congregation who have keen interests in either of those three structural bases, and then the subsets that will enlist others. Next slide, please. Beginning a capital campaign, depending upon your following the screen or the handout, uh, the first step for me after a contract letter, so to speak, would be, and we have worked on nominations for a writing team, to put together a case for support. So any way anybody who raises money does this in significant numbers, of course, is to prepare a case for support. That is not an easy project. So we have a number of people who have been assigned or volunteered to help me write the case for support. The case for support cannot be a combination of voices. We gather data, we put the data together, and I will write the case for support out of the data in one voice. Make sense? Mm -hmm. And I'm happy to do that, and I like to do it. The data gathering is already underway in anticipation of us at least writing a case for support and moving through the processes to a place where the feasibility study is completed. So that's a lot of months. So my aggressive timeline is to start almost immediately. We're gonna have, have to have a case for support anyway, but it, it's, it's a very important thing, redundant, I know it. The quicker you get feedback from the drawings, the concept drawings, the faster we can move. What do you think? Yes, did you get that? Yes. What did I just say? Yeah, you see what happens when you don't have one voice? <laughs> the quicker we move on your recommendations, don't take more than two weeks. At the end of two weeks, if there's no feedback, I think I would be ready to do the case for support on these concept drawings. So thank you again, Scott. Good work. The data gathering begins with the material we've already had for the first project that we could not proceed with prior to COVID. That data is still relevant in many ways because some things have not changed. On the other hand, you are not the congregation that we worked with in its entirety the first time around. Things are very different, yes? So I'm thinking about the implication of lots of things. And you'll see this as we move quickly through the rest of this. Now look at down at the third bullet. The case for support contains definitive material essential to support a feasibility study process. We're not building anything yet. I need to have a case for support to sit down with people with expectations you'll see in a moment, to sit down with people in confidential conversations. When we did this first time around, Scott, I interviewed 84 people face to face for the first project. And that gave me as much data as I could connect from those interviews. And the interview process takes a significant amount of time, best case over a full month of interviews. So I'm gonna do those here in the building and I could do some by phone, but I don't want to, but I could if people are in Nebraska or someplace hiding out somewhere. And then I could do them also in small groups, but that's not as helpful. I really do enjoy personal interviews with all of the donor suspects at the, at the current reality. This definitive material is presented in exactly the same way to every interview, in exactly the same way, with the same questions being asked of everybody, with no variations in the questions. That way I, I can guarantee in, to some way the extent of the responses and then eventually the case for support will be finished and the process for moving that forward. 
One of the things we do not have is a theme for the capital campaign or a theme for the whole project. That's a very important consideration. So the writing team will be charged with coming up with recommendations, plural, of a possible theme for the case for support and the entirety of the project. Now when I think about uh, what it means to do something on behalf of the finances, I mentioned the case for support. Redundant, but I'm gonna do it again. We already have a half a million dollars toward the goal of, a mi of two million dollars. That means the fundraising portion of the campaign is how much money? Yeah, some of you aren't clear about that either, so one voice is going to be a nice thing. So the goal is to raise a million five hundred thousand dollars, and my own mind is about contingencies, but I'm reassured that contingencies are in there. Uh, I'll, I'll hedge my bet and say I'm going to win that argument. But just think about cost overruns and goal creep, where Scott Gold Creek was a very important process when congregations start looking at drawings. Oh, why don't we just add this? That's only 100,000, and it just goes like that. Yes, David? How long did it take us to get to 500,000? Uh, it's largely a gift. Yes. Yeah. It's already there. It's, I, I'm sure it's secure. Uh, the trustees know about it. The leadership team knows about it. Randy knows about it. So that's not something since the last, since the last thing that that's been here. It's been here for a while. Yeah. How long? Some has been here for a while. And some is within the last year or two. Okay. So we have a half a million dollars, and that's secure. Yes. Yes. Yep. Yeah. I've invested that in my company, so I'm really sorry. <laughs> All right. So financial goals are clarified. Now, here's the risk reward factor. In the ways in which I've learned how to do chart of gifts, this is a very important thing and it's related to this slide. If we are attempting to raise a million and a half dollars at what I would describe as a 50% chart, the lead gift would be 50% of 1.5 million or 700 and how much, 700,000 plus. Who here is gonna give that $700,000? Raise your hands. Thank you, precisely the issue. Whenever the lead gift is less than half of the goal, the pressure in the chart of gifts moves down to smaller donors. You follow me? That means at the bottom of the list, we have to raise, toward the bottom, a significant amount of donors from the donor pool to raise the balance unfunded by major donors. And that's one of my biggest concerns, and that was one of the real concerns the first time around. We could not find an adequate gift to cover at least 50%. So I've done a 50% chart, a 40% chart, and a 30% chart. If we can't raise a 30% chart, we're gonna be in the same boat that we were before. So I'm very transparent about this. This project is dependent upon significant generosity one, to the operating life of the church. Two, to the capital campaign. We cannot undercut the operating life of the church and move money out of our weekly giving into a capital campaign that threatens the future of the congregation. So those are things that just off the top of my head are very important for you to understand. Are you okay so far? Mm -hmm. After my report is done, then Randy's gonna host Q's and A uh, q and is about any part of this whole process. I drew upon Mr. Wesley's good ideas, uh, do all the good you can for all the people you can, and that runs on a little bit in, in phrase after phrase. But it seems to me that the whole project itself, no matter what the, Scott, the drawings look like or what you eventually want to do, we are still attempting to do two things, and Keith mentioned it earlier. We are a missional congregation, and our facilities are not only for ourselves. If you're building for yourselves, and I want to be a part of that for myself too, and only for ourselves, I'm not going to support the campaign personally. That's a mistake. The facilities are tools for ministry. Let's say that together. The facilities are tools for ministry. 
And that's the substance of it, that we use it a lot and the community does, is remarkable. Let's go to the next piece. This will go more quickly. Okay, so this is the way in which a case for support is accomplished. You can look at your own paper, which is more detailed, or you can look at the slides, which are more a summary. I'll look at this quickly with you. A writing team is already being formed. I'm ready to work with those as soon as we can, and as soon as we get your feedback would be the best idea. Inside the writing team, I will assign tasks in twos and threes uh, to undertake the full task as we go forward. The data is presented organized in a first draft of the case for support, which the leadership team and trustees will have to affirm, and we are getting ready then for the first church conference. The working draft is presented as I've illustrated, an affirmed case after amendments, affirmed case after any amendments, goes to the first church conference. In my own timeline, based upon certain variables, uh, I expected or would hope for that first church conference would be the end of August or early September. So that's how quickly we're going to try to work based upon the feedback. If you go to the next slide, after the case is affirmed, a feasibility study is launched. So you have to give permission as a congregation to launch a feasibility study. So that happens in the first church conference. A case is affirmed and the congregation authorizes a feasibility study with all the implications of what I outlined earlier. The consultant will work with an appointment secretary. That's will be the last time uh, that's already in the work. The consultant will conduct interviews for at least half people who would represent 50 or 60% of the current worship <coughs> average. What is that? That's off the top of your head. What's the current average attendance? Uh, Give me a number to work with. 100. About what? 100. 100. That means I would want to see, best case scenario, 60 people face to face, and they could be in individuals or couples. Well, first time we did this, we had a couple of family groups, and even the children participated, and if they come, I'll ask them questions. Why is there air is one of those questions I ask kids. <laughs> and going forward, each interview session includes the same questions. I'm looking for the feasibility about several different things. The future of the congregation, its strengths, weaknesses, and so forth. And also a projection of what any household might think they would give if the project is approved. Might think. I'm not asking for anybody to sign anything. I'm looking for possibilities in terms of a person's gift. The feasibility will come back with recommendations that will be useful for the leadership team about strengths and weaknesses, all kinds of blocks and barriers. I like to talk about those a lot. And then possible new initiatives based upon the drawings that I'll have. Uh, something like you have here, uh, a project set of drawings that fit into the case where everybody can take with them as I interview and go from there. When the feasibility study is finished, and I'll come back with recommendations, and everybody in the congregation will get a copy of the completed feasibility study. Normally when I'm doing this, it's 30 to 45 pages. No one's name will ever be mentioned in the feasibility study. What did I just say? Even then, you're not even sure. <laughs> so I want you to think clearly about, clearly about this. The only way I have names is on the appointment list. When I'm writing the feasibility study, I only have numbers at the top corner of my intake form, 001, 002, and I destroy the appointment process altogether. So I'm writing only out of a sense of, do I have all the the data I need in front of me, and no names are associated with it. The finished feasibility study then opens the floor of a church conference to have conversation and helpful and holy dialogue about whether or not we proceed to a capital campaign. 
at that church conference, the capital campaign, if affirmed, will move forward and we will start into the phases for fundraising. If you go to the next slide, you'll see results of the feasibility study as they are outlined. Is that what's there? Yep, we can skip that for the moment. And then go to generally results from the feasibility study is the next slide. I think this is moving along okay. Uh, as many as 30 to 45 pages, thank you. <clears throat> I'll write the feasibility study with recommendations. There will never ever, in the way I do capital campaigns, be more than seven recommendations over the entirety of the project. There will be no amendments to the drawings. Once you authorize a capital campaign, we are done with the drawings. What do you think? And that's, that's going to give Scott an opportunity to get started with projecting contracts and all the kind of things that the building team has to work with while I'm working with the capital campaign team. A very important enterprise. Okay, let's go to the next slide. If that's the last slide, is it? Fundraising components, is that next? Okay, thank you. So here's, a, here's what I would do. Based upon what we believe to be true about the feasibility study and the projections, we will begin then the formal fundraising component with covenant cards or commitment cards. I don't like the word pledge cards at all because pledge cards, these have been tested in court in the country, pledge cards signed are a legal binding document if it goes to the courts. Seriously. So I don't use the word pledge, I use covenant or commitment. And in the Christian community, covenant is a much better word. I covenant to do this over how many years? This actually, for the building side of it and the finance side of it, for the leadership team and everybody else, creates a paradoxical issue. Let's, well, I pretty much know what I'm going to do in terms of how I can support the campaign. If I make a covenant and I sign that covenant, how many years will it take me to pay that goal off? It's a serious matter when it comes to financing the actual campaign. Scott knows this from many other opportunities. We're going to have to find a vendor who will loan us the money because the campaign commitments don't come in all up front. So on the leadership side of the church and the trustees and others, we have to think about how are we gonna finance the construction project so we can actually get started with it whenever in the timeline we choose to get started with it and as I said earlier, many variables about that. I projected two things here. One, we, who remembers John Nepley? Mm. When John Nepley and I were working on this kind of thing, we always had an early bird campaign. So in some, I was able to say, or he would stay in front of the congregation, say in front of the congregation, this is the commitment of the leadership team in summary, not without any names. <laughs> Everybody knows know who you are anyway, but without any names or individual commitments. The sum of the leadership team to a capital campaign is a good marker for our success. Do you hear that? The leadership team is a good marker for success. There's a major donor component to this that will impact the chart of gifts. So I'm thinking about that just now. If we do a 30% chart and down all the way to the bottom donors who may be $50 a week or $50 a year, who knows that that process is gonna take a while. Best case major donor would be up to five years. So if a major donor commits to a quarter of a million dollars, I've had a lot of those over the years, they're gonna take five years to do it. And they're gonna take five years to do that because they don't know what the market is gonna look like. Yes, so a lot of that is held funds, invested portfolios. So the major donor campaign and an early bird campaign will give me a lot of information about how I might write the feasibility study. 
And then the rest of it is general campaigning, which I suspect if the feasibility study is done and affirmed before Thanksgiving, we could start the fundraising component after the first of the year. Or some people might want to give a year-end gift to the campaign for tax purposes. The final summary of the campaign then, how much money have we actually raised, goes to the third church conference and the final one. This is how much money we have raised. If the feasibility study is even close, we have raised this much money. We will need to finance this much money over what period of time, from what vendor, at what interest, and all and all goes with lots of variables. And then we will be able to complete the campaign over probably two, three, four, or five years. I have no way of knowing that. Okay, well I think that's everything I can do to help you. Okay. Uh, Randy will lead the Q&A time for all of us, and we'll be able to go from there. Thank you for the opportunity to put this summary report in front of you. Appreciate it. Thank you. to anticipate questions that you might have. So the first one, why do we need to build or change anything? Did we cover that pretty well today? Why are we still talking about this? Let's just do it. And I think Pastor Ed addressed a lot of a lot of that, right? It's, it's a process and um, things with the church don't happen Quickly, right? And I put it that way. It takes time, and it's churches are made of of many, many people, many, many families, and we, as a family, need time to think about things and look at things and do what's best, right? So we're not going to just jump right into this and do it. How much will it cost? Uh, we kind of touched on that um, during the preliminary design process. Scott's firm has given the building exploratory team a, a budgetary cost estimate. The trustees added what we think will be the cost of resurfacing the parking lot. Trustees knows that our boiler is at the end of its life. So we're anticipating replacing the current boiler with one maybe a little bit larger because we're gonna have some new, new space. So trustees have set aside some budgetary estimates for that. So bottom line, we're anticipating this project, as we said, as Pastor Ed said, about two million, of which the trustees has committed 500,000. That's cash on hand, if you will, that's invested in a safe, secure uh, area. When could we start this project? When could we start construction breaking ground? And as you've heard, there's a lot of work to be done, um, and trust or the exploratory team is is thinking realistic, best case, sometime in 24, 2024, spring, summer, fall of 2024. Okay, and again, that's that's probably best case if everything lines up and everything proceeds moving forward. What can I do to help? Um, number one thing, you have you came this morning, so I thank you for that. Um, talk about it with our other members of the congregation, take the drawings home, look them over, think about it, pray about them. And you've heard Pastor Ed say there's gonna be opportunities to serve on this project. This is, this is a bigger project than just the eight, nine, or 10 people that have been working on the exploratory team. So that's all I've got. I will entertain some questions. It's like 1020, so Pastor Ed, thank you for uh, condensing your three hour talk <laughs> into 30 minutes. Any other questions? Yes. I have a question. I, I, I'm sort of ignorant about, about how to get together financing, but I know that uh, that the 
the churches are churches are non profitable institutions, correct? Can churches apply for grants for projects like this, like from government grants, like the senior center does? The senior center is a, a non profitable institution. It's allowed to apply for grants to do some of their projects. Are are we permitted to do that? That's a very good question, and frankly, I do not know the answer. I mean, I don't know anything about how to do it or how or anything like that. I just know that it happens. Yeah. Anybody, anybody know the answer to that? Yeah. GJ. So, in my experience with Life Path on stuff like that, I mean, basically, as soon as you say Jesus, um, you kind of close that door. Um, there are aspects of it, though. Take child care. Um, we'll just take Seiko, and we'll use that as an example. Seiko as a non as, as a nonprofit, but a non you know they're not primarily a faith based organization. They could pursue such funding, um, you know, and how that could become a component. That's certainly a, a, an avenue that could be wandered down. Um, but as as a church to go to government for funding, that's pretty much a, a, a closed door. There's very 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 narrow avenues for that. And So we, that's something that we would be looking into, yeah, other funding that, avenues. And Pat Tume was our senator. He and I talked on the phone about a child advocacy grant, and he was happy to have the staff work with the a million dollar grant for child advocacy, and the government shut all that down. Mm -hmm. But the people out there who will talk to us mm -hmm. beyond. Another question. Randy, how would you like to funnel that specific information on the farm since that is a two week timeline? We shouldn't leave here without an address or a way to get information back to someone. Um, yeah, good point. Let me think about that, but I, I, I do agree that we should be getting that feedback fairly quickly and maybe that's something we can do a kind of an after informational session. Um, Quick answer to that is, is that uh, Connie can, we can gather that information in the church office. You can send it to info at stewardstownumc.org. Subject line, facility, something, something. That something, a, a, a subject line would be okay. like facility or whatever, and then we can pass it along <coughs> to the team. Perfect. Okay. Julie. How are people who are not in attendance this morning supposed to know to provide feedback? Are you providing them? the schematics and information somehow to give that? Yeah, we, we can do that. We can put the, uh, the briefing material on our church website and uh, have Connie send out an email blast that here's where, the, here's where the presentation is, have a look at it, and we're looking for feedback from those folks. Or anybody here can pass the word on. We can do it during worship tomorrow. There you go. Yeah, and maybe have some copies available for people to pick up. Absolutely. Yeah. GJ. I don't have any expectation to have this information, but I'd be curious to know what um, just our annual commitment card campaign has gathered for data and how close we've come to meeting those campaign numbers annually. I'd love to see that data over like the last two to three years. Okay, I can share that. The commitments that we get on the commitment cards are less than 50% of what we receive throughout the year. So we don't have a lot of people making those commitments. However, those that do make the commitments, I would say 90 to 95% meet those commitments. Thank you. So you're saying that of the people that do turn in the commitment card, the response is about 
90%. Yeah. We just don't have enough actually turning in right. commitment cards. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Once you start building, how long would it take to complete the building? That's a very, very good question. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to defer that one to Scott. So based on our survey, there are several things that are holding up instruction uh, that we found in the industry right now. One of the big ones is electric panel boards. Uh, we've been waiting on those for eight to 12 months on some projects. Uh, unfortunately, pouring through the, uh, the electric room, the mechanical room, <laughs> they will need replacement, which means as soon as those boards are, as soon as we've done the engineering for the Placements, those orders need to be put in, even if there's not a permit in place. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so I would say construction timeline, uh, probably a year from uh, when you have a final set of construction documents to completion. That doesn't mean that active construction will be going on for a year. I'd say we could probably get that closer to seven to nine months. Mm -hmm. uh, but the long, the big ticket long need items mechanical equipment, electric panels, and the elevator. Uh, the actual work on the building that will shut down certain areas can progress a lot faster. Right. At one point, one point or two million, did that include any of the accessories that we had talked about? It's yes, it did. It, it did. included the parking lot, included some money for a new boiler. Okay. Yes. 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 Okay. So, um, so will it shut down Seiko? Will it shut down the Seeker Center and theater? I mean, I'm thinking that's going to affect a lot of those areas. Yeah, that's that's something that will need to be addressed. And again, keep in mind this: the bulk of this work is right outside these windows. Okay, and some renovation in this hallway, the hallway upstairs, and I'll call it the ramp door entrance. So, I mean, there's, there's going to be some disruption. I don't know as if it would actually shut them down. It may, mean, it may mean a different access, or depending on uh, what the time frame is, you know, during, if the bulk of the construction could be during summer, Seiko is not here during summer, right? Summer theater is. They can, they can be on our lawn, it's okay. There you go. <laughs> but but I, I will say that, I mean, kind of think of this as, has anybody ever renovated your kitchen? <laughs> okay, so you know during a kitchen renovation, it's disruptive. You might have to move the microwave to the dining room and use the microwave and maybe a hot plate in the, kit, in the, in the garage, <laughs> but you make it work, right? And when it's all done, they're like, wow, this is this is fantastic. So there's going to be a little bit of discomfort, if you will, some, and and these guys do this all the time. So we'll, we'll figure we would figure that out. So the short answer is probably, but it's short term, and depending on what it is, it can be worked around. Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Any other questions? Okay, um, again, thank you all for coming. And I do need to do a shout out to Pat Dadlock, who graciously agreed to <laughs> And now that we're finished, you all can check underneath your seats for that lucky yellow ticket. And come up and get your plate. You know what? Before we. Could I get your attention for one more minute? I dismissed you too soon. We do want to do some closing remarks and a closing prayer. Pastor Keith. Yeah, now you're not going to hear anything I said because you're wondering if that ticket is underneath your chair. Yeah, do so. it. As I look around, a um, couple of different things. One is is that is that the generation that built this building is a different generation than we had then. 
but they were able to, based upon, they were, they were standing on the shoulders of our ancestors, having a vision of what God can do, and building something magnificent that was beyond anything they could imagine, and they stepped out in faith to do it. Um, and that generation was the silent generation. Looking around in here, I think there may be only one person in the room who was born before 1945, which means that everybody here is a boomer, unless you're younger. And for us, boomers, there is a spiritual movement or growth that takes place in this part of our lives. Because one of the sins of the boomers, if, if, and I'm speaking for myself too, is that we think everything is about us and that it's for us. And that the spiritual movement is, is that we really are here for others. It's not about us. It's about others. And because boomers have a really, really difficult time conceiving the possibility that we will die. We're going to be here forever, right? And we're going to be in charge forever. So we don't think about legacy. That changes. It's not about us. And there is a legacy. What do we do for the world around us and the community around us? And what do we do for the future generations of, of the followers of Jesus Christ who may be standing on our shoulders as they go forward in faith. So this is a spiritual movement. It's not about a building, it's not about money. It's about what God is doing in us and through us and how God will always provide what we need if we are faithful. Amen? Amen. Lord, we thank you for this gathering. We thank you for the hearts. Continue to move our heart to be aligned with your heart as we love you and we love others in your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.